Hello, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic, where uh, I've been a bit remiss and I haven't um, done a video covering last week's diabolical Sudoku from the Daily Telegraph. Um, as you know, or you will know if you're a regular follower of the channel, um, we're quite a big fan of the diabolical Sudoku. It's the hardest puzzle that I've seen uh, published in a newspaper anywhere in the world, um, and it's seriously difficult. Um, now, this one, as usual, they tend to have a pattern to them in the sense that you can actually get make a lot of progress um, without knowing any difficult techniques, um, and then you're sort of left with a, an end game conundrum that you have to figure out. Um, so what you can see on screen there is uh, the black numbers are the original position. So if you do want to try the puzzle, then uh, take out a piece of paper or whatever software you use and just use the black numbers. And the blue numbers are the numbers that you can get without doing anything clever. Um, and now the pencil marks that I've made here are all of the cells where um, the cell is limited to one of two possibilities. You can see every example there. Um, you can each cell in question can only contain one of two numbers. And from here we can actually uh, spot the trick necessary to finish the puzzle. And it's one I don't think we've covered on the channel before. Um, but it's one of these little uh, uniqueness techniques that comes up from time to time. And so have a pause the video and study the grid and see if you can spot where there might be a uniqueness constraint. And maybe just to remind you, uh, what I'll do is I'll just change a couple of the numbers and we can ask ourselves, I'm going to change these two ones here to nines and imagine this was the pattern. And I want to focus on the four cells here that have the numbers four and nine in them. And you can see um, this pattern here cannot appear uh, in a Sudoku that has a unique solution. Um, why do I say that? Well, because if, if, for example, this was a 9, that would mean this was a 9, this was a 4, and this was a 4. But there is no way of disambiguating when this is a 9 from when this is a 4. Because all that happens if this changes from a 9 to a 4 is that this becomes a 4, this switches to a 9, and this switches to a 9. So there are, in effect, you just switch the polarity of each cell in this set of four cells and you get a second solution to the puzzle. Now, we know that good Sudoku puzzles have only one solution, and we can use that, that knowledge, the fact that there is only one solution, to our advantage when we're solving. So let's just replace um, place that with what we actually had on the screen. So we've just looked at the simple sort of deadly pattern, if you like, that we need to avoid, but we can actually extend that um, from a 2x2 two two situation into a 2x3 situation relatively easily. So now I want to think about this cell. And I want to think about this cell because we have, if we look along here, we've got 491914. So there's a triple uh, along the bottom row here. And we've got two cells here that contain two components of the triple in row 7. So we've got a 1, 4 here and a 4, 9 here. So my simple question, looking at this cell, is is it possible that in the final solution we would see either a 1 or a 9 in this cell? Now obviously it can't contain a 4, the question is just as valid for 4, but can this, this cell contain a 1 or a 9? Let's ask ourselves that question. The answer is no. Uh, for exactly the same reason as the sort of X-wing deadly pattern gave us a problem. Um, but let me explain why now. So what I'll do is I'll switch to big numbers and let's imagine that this was a, in the printed solution when we saw it, this cell contained a 1. What would be the impact of that on this grid? Well you can see immediately this would be a 4, this would be a 1, this would be a 9, this would be a 4, and this would be a 9. So we would have this arrangement of 1s, 4s and 9s in these bottom, well in row 7 and row 9 here. So just fix that in your mind for a moment and let's ask ourselves the difference between this and what happens if we switch instead to make, oh, not, not a 6, to make this a 9. What happens? 
does it does does the fact we've selected a nine here instead change anything else in the solution apart from these six cells we're focusing on? And what we're going to see is it doesn't. It only changes those six cells. Okay, so nine is going to force four, nine, one, four, and one. So you can see all that's happened there is that these six cells in question have swapped their values to the other value but nothing else has changed there is no way you know this this is still a one and a four pair this is still a nine and a one pair this is still a four and a nine pair along the rows we still have the numbers nine one four occupying the same three spaces in the grid just in a different order but there's no way of as I said before these six cells don't impact on any other cell because remember you might say oh yes it does Simon because look it affects this cell up here this cell here you know is affected by the fact that there is a one here yeah but remember when this wasn't a one this was a one so either selection here because this is just a one nine pair doesn't impact actually on this cell so what we have here is a uniqueness problem. We have two solutions to the puzzle and we know therefore that we need to avoid this. So if you manage to spot this, if you can spot this, these five cells, which you can spot from the fact that, you know, just when you list all the cells that contain two solutions only, we can move to this cell and know for a fact it can't contain a one, four or a nine. Now let's look at what it can contain. So in theory, it could be a 1, 7, or a 9 before we get to our constraint. But you can see immediately, being able to eliminate a 1 and a 9 from this cell is massively powerful. Because now, all of a sudden, I'm able to say with certainty that this is a 7. And that absolutely um, uh, finishes the puzzle. Oh, in fact, I just realized I could have put a 6 and a 7 combination into here at the start. It doesn't make any difference, but you can see that once you... Once you manage to locate that this is the seven, uh, this becomes a six, that becomes a seven, this becomes a six, um, and you're home and hose, the whole puzzle just completely collapses. So this is the critical step, just told in last Friday's diabolical. As I say, very useful tool. Always, I think, getting comfortable with the concept of uniqueness is, is one of these higher skills that is necessary to become a really, really proficient Sudoku solver. So study that, be interested to have your thoughts. If you wanted to take a look at any other uh, puzzles that you think might contain uniqueness constraints, happy to do so. Just send them over to us. Our Twitter account is at Cryptic Cracking and our uh, email address is crackingthecryptic at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the content, please subscribe. We appreciate that and give us a like or a thumbs up and we'll be back soon with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.